Well, good morning, Anthem. How are you guys? Good. Good to see you. Welcome to Anthem Church. We are glad that you're here, whether it's your first time or your 50th time. Welcome, welcome. We're starting a brand new series called Now That's a Good Question. I wonder uh, today if you have any questions in regards to the faith, or, or maybe maybe more specifically in question, uh, questions regarding how the faith interacts the current world that we're living in. Uh, let's put it this way. If you, if you dropped into a coma, let's just pick an arbitrary date, March 1st, 2020. Let's just say you went to sleep and you woke up today. And what'd you do? You called your, one of your best friends, one of your best guy friends or girlfriends, and you said, hey, let's go get a coffee. I need you to pick me up to speed with what's happened over the last three and a half years. You'd be like, hey, we're gonna need, how much time do you have, <laughs> Right? We're going to need to do more than a coffee, more than a lunch. We have a lot we have to, or or maybe you're like, Coma's so sad. Okay, time machine. Time machine from March 1st, 2020 to today. Wouldn't you have some explaining to? Can you imagine them watching the news right now and trying to make, like, make sense of what it's saying and even some of the language? or, Or how about if they hopped on social media right now? First of all, they wouldn't even know what X is. They'd be like, where did Twitter go? And if they made their way onto X or the artist formerly known as Twitter, then they probably would be genuinely confused by people's takes, wouldn't they be? They'd be like, what is happening? And be like, hold on, I got to catch you up for the last three years. As a result, Christians really have been asking a lot of questions. So now that's a good question. Isn't a, isn't a series about apologetics, although we could have one, that would be very interesting, answering the questions of, of, of the faith that have been around for generations and decades. No, now that's a good question. More is designed to deal with, it's designed to deal with the things that we are currently facing in real live time. So, so. Let me tell you where we're going with this series, okay? Today, we're just going to answer the question, how would Jesus interact in the world that we live in? That's the only question we're asking. Generally speaking, setting a tone, the person of Jesus, knowing what we know from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the surrounding text, knowing about the personality of Jesus, knowing about the things that he said, about how he lived, about how he loved, about the life that ultimately he projected for us, modeled for us, right? The the reason that we follow him, the reason that we're disciples of him is because he did it best, amen? Amen. Like he did it best. And it wasn't that, that first century Israel wasn't without cultural challenges. And every other society that, that was before first century Israel and every other society that was after, they've all had their challenges. They've all had their quote unquote questions about how to engage the world around them. So today we just simply set a tone by answering the question, how would Jesus interact in the world that we're living in. We're gonna do two things with that. I'll explain more in just a moment. But I wanna tell you what we're doing for the rest of the series as well. These are the types of questions that we're going to answer. Next week, we're gonna ask the question, is there any other way to heaven besides Jesus? That's a question that's going around. We've got celebrities that are asking that question. Right, you know, you get out of church and you're like, hey, Siri, take me the fastest way home. Right, it offers three routes and they're all similar and there's a little bit of traffic here and you hate traffic, so you go the different direction. So we're going, well, hey, maybe, hey, Siri, show me a different way to heaven. Maybe there's some back door that we can open up. (laughs) It was an illustration, Siri. Heaven. So next week we're going to answer the question. 
that many people ask in our society. That was a great moment, unplanned, by the way. <laughs> Is there really only one way to heaven? The week after that, we're going to have some fun. We're going to ask the question, was Jesus a Democrat or a Republican? <laughs> Newsflash, you're probably going to get offended. And you're like, well, which side are you going to offend? <laughs> Both. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here's what I'm saying. I want you to come in. I want you to lean in. I want you to lean in on that week. Don't skip that week. Don't be like, ah, I'm not going to that church. They're going to get political. You're like, well, why, why, are you even, why do you even care? Just preach the gospel. Just preach what Jesus said. Just preach God's word. Listen, I'm all about that. Here's all I'm saying. All I'm saying is this. For the last three years, time machine, fast forward, March 1st to now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say we've broadly taught that, and many Christians don't know how to interact in the nuance of our culture because even though the gospel is simple, a lot of the challenges we face are really complex. Would you agree? And there's tension, and we don't know what to say, and we don't know what to do, and we're not sure of, of how to interact or engage. Do we step up or are we more me, uh, quiet on this subject? Do we, do we fight that? Or are we more like love and missions and focus on that thing and then God will work it out in the end? Or um, do, we, do we challenge our, our, our family members who have the wrong views? And are we more proactive in that challenge? Are we more reactive in the fact that it just comes up on Thanksgiving? Or, or, or what do we say? Or when do we be quiet? Should I be engaged in social media online? How much should I know about politicians? Should I know about my city council members? Should I research them? Like all of these questions are coming as a result of what's happened in many cases in the last three years. We've become more interested in a lot of things we didn't even know we had to be interested in. And so we're going to ask the question, is this a political church? No, it's not. This is a Jesus-following, Bible-believing, spirit-led church. And we're going to help, we're going to help all of us understand what it looks like to keep those priorities as we engage politics, because they do impact people. And you know what we care about? People. You know why? Because we are Jesus-following, Bible-believing, Spirit-led people. That's why. And the God we serve loves people. And the final week, woo, if that week wasn't controversial enough for you, week four. We're going to ask the question, how would Jesus interact with the LGBTQ community? So if you hate awkward, I'll see you in four weeks. <laughs> Just kidding. I want you, I want to encourage you over the course of this series to engage it. Even if you're like, man, I want nothing to do with some of these hard conversations. I want to run as fast and as far away. I'm just telling you, listen, the world out there is answering these questions. If you have kids... The world out there is answering these questions for them. So we need to stand and teach them not only the right answers, the right posture, the right heart, the right tone, because how many of you know that following Jesus isn't just about having the right answers? Here's, here's the illustration that I think a lot of us um, have fallen victim to. I, th I think we kind of create our own version of Jesus. And, and to illustrate this, you guys remember, um, or even, not even, you don't need to remember, but if you've ever been to Disneyland or Knott's Berry Farm and you're walking around the park, there's these little stands. And the little stands are where you can get your picture drawn in, but it's not any picture, it's a character. You know what I'm talking about? Like where they, they draw you, but they really laser in on an aspect of you. Like if you're a 13 year old girl, I do not recommend you get a character of you. You guys know what I'm talking about? Okay, well, well let's have some fun to this morning before we dive in, because we're going to dive into a bunch of controversy. We've got to laugh a little bit before we do that, right? Okay, first, who's this? You see, even, even like some of the ladies in the room are like, I'll tell you who that is. That is Elvis. You, you remember the scene in the Elvis movie where he's in the theater and he does the hip shivel for the first time. And like the girls fall back in like a trance. They're like, oh my gosh, no ever man has ever danced like this before. 
Man, I, I really, in that moment, felt just the power of the influence that this guy had in his music. And then you see like this, and what do they do? They just exaggerate an aspect of his chin, right? He's got a big old chin, so they, they, maybe he doesn't even have that big of a chin, but they, they really laser in, and then his lips, right? He's got the, he's got the hunky lip right here, right? The, the sexy lip. What about this one? Who's this? How many of you guys think of that old fireman character that he used to do? I think it was on, was it Mad TV? In Living Color, the original skit show. Remember? Hey, 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 you guys. And so what they do, they took this picture and they exaggerated his teeth, right? Made him big and white. Does he have big teeth? Sure. Are they that big? No, they're not that big. But that's the whole idea of it. How How about this one right here? Simon Cowell. By the way, I'm so proud of you guys for knowing all these people. It's kind of a big deal that you do, right? They're, they're very relevant in culture, right? So this guy's been making fun of people for his whole life. So can we get allowed to make fun of him a little bit, right? No, what they do here is he doesn't have any super dramatic features. In fact, all he has now is Botox. But um, his che- they made his cheeks look real big, right? How about this guy right here? Who's this? I love that everybody at Anthem Church knows who Snoop Dogg is. Like when he, this picture doesn't even look that much like Snoop Dogg. He's got this massive neck. He looks like an alpaca. And, right, and they made his face real skinny. Sure, it looks like aspects of him, but, but surely the, the artist is, is attempting to do something. What is the artist attempting to do here? The artist is attempting to take an aspect of the person and what? Exaggerate it. Here's, the, here's what's happening in the Christian church. What's happening in the Christian church is we've taken aspects of Jesus. And you know what we do? We make a little caricature of Jesus. And that's our Jesus. And we exaggerate an element of scripture. We exaggerate uh, right, something that we really like or, or maybe are part of our story and how we, we came to know him. And we exaggerate that part. And then all the other parts we kind of like slowly ignore. And then we start to kind of cherry pick. Oh, I like that verse. Put that one on my bumper. Oh, I like that one. Put that one up the wall. Oh my gosh, goes really well with the new decor. Love it, right? <laughs> so we put up the verses we like. We, we kind of pick. We cherry pick. We chop. Ooh, ooh that, that's a hard verse. Ooh, get that verse out. Or ooh, that verse may offend my aunt. So pull that one out, right? And so we start to just cherry pick and we, we shape a Jesus that looks more like a mascot and less like a Lord. And so we show up, and then the culture's shifting, and every one of us shows up, and we're ready to fight. You know what we got? Mascot Jesus. And I'm going to tell you why this is wrong, because mascot Jesus says so. But you know who mascot Jesus isn't? The Jesus of the scriptures. Because you made him. You created him. And so when we show up to the, the quote-unquote culture wars, what are we fighting? Why are we fighting? And who are we fighting for? Because I'm going to tell you right now, God's not going to bless you and I if we fight our way. You know what God's interested in blessing? You know what he's interested in getting behind? You know what he promises to give victory over? When we show up ready to fight his way. That's what he's ready to bless. That's what he's ready to get behind. That's what he promises that you'll have victory over. Not if we show up and we're like, mascot Jesus, where we exaggerated all the things we liked, ignored all the things we didn't like, and showed up to the battle wanting to fight our way with our story, right, for our purposes. So, for the next four weeks, two things are going to happen in concert, side by side. On one hand, we're going to give a really honest depiction of what's happened in our world. Because we need to know what it is that's out there. We need to know how to shape 
the next generation of followers. We need to know how to get into those really complex situations that has all kinds of nuance. We need to know what to say and how to say it and how to be prayerful. We need to know how to prepare ourselves for those conversations. We need to know how to, know how to follow up with those conversations. We need to know what, what we need to be paying attention, right, in regards to politics. And we need to know how to pay attention when it comes to, to classrooms and education and, and courtrooms. And man, just even just this last week, I, I went to a sentencing for a young, young man that was murdered in broad daylight on a Thursday outside of an elementary room. And all of a sudden, you know what I started asking the investigator? Some in questions about the courtroom. You know what I became interested in? Some of the ways that, that the courtroom shapes our society. Do you know why? Because I care about people, and it's impacting them. And so we've got to start waking up to the real war, but we can't wake up and fight our way. And that's been some of the challenges that I've seen, is Christians fighting in their own way. If you have your Bibles, open up Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, as we answer this question, how would Jesus interact with the world we are living in? I want to be honest with you. What I'm going to read to you is Romans chapter 1, verse 18. It is not about modern day America. It's Paul writing about Rome. However, Rome has shaped much of literature, much, I mean, if you grew up uh, and went to the public school system like I did, you were introduced to Roman literature, you were introduced to even their way of, of, of living, their, their theology, you were introduced, introduced to how they lived, how they shaped entertainment. Uh, Rome was a powerful in their day, but its influence continues on. And, and Christians... Uh, were beginning to be established in Rome, in a society that didn't necessarily subject themselves to one God or even put themselves under any one God. It was many gods. And as a result, uh, slowly but surely, even though there was many gods, there was, a, there was a secularization of Rome over time. Well, Paul will write about that reality. And he'll write to Christians so that they understand the progression where they're at in that progression, and ultimately how they're called to respond in that. And here's what I want to do. I want to read that for you today, because I want you to see that there are parallels as America becomes more secular, so that we know where this is going, and we know how to respond, not in fear, but in faith. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So even in our sinful behavior, this is the point of application, right? Not the point of the sermon, but really, really important for you. If you're newer to the faith, window shopping the faith, trying to understand the relationship between truth and God is as you live a life that's distant from God and how you're living the truth becomes harder for you to understand. The Bible even describes this as like, you were blind, but then you see. What it's saying is the ways of God were so foreign to you that you literally could not see them. And part of that is because we're living in our own way. So that's, an, that's, a, that's a mark of an individual living that way. That when we live that way, it suppresses the truth. Watch what happens when that happens with an entire culture. Since what we may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. Watch this. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have clearly been, what? What does that say? Seen. You know what the difference between sharing your faith and seeing God's creation is? One is heard, the other is seen. So this isn't about sharing the good news of Jesus. By the way, this is Paul writing post-Jesus, post-resurrection, in the age of the church and the spirit. And he's writing, and you know what he's saying? He's saying, listen, even if you were to remove all of that, just walk outside. And if you were to walk outside and you were, did anybody see the sky last night, by the way? Oh my gosh. That was an un, I mean, not just a sunset, it lit up right from west to east, 
beautiful pinks and, and oranges and yellows. I mean, to walk in, out and see that sky. We had an event in the afternoon yesterday, and as we were wrapping up the event, we just looked up and it was like, man, look at the world that God has made. And what, what Paul is writing to Rome is like, it's really difficult to look at that world and be like, what an accident. Like in just looking at the sky last night, what it's saying is that you could maybe determine that there's a good God who has eternal power, a divine nature. It's clearly not heard from another Christian. It can be just seen. That means if you never even met another person, you just woke up in a village somewhere. And I know it's not even a village because there's nobody there. You just woke up in the forest. It's just you in the trees and you're the new jungle book. You're the new Mowgli. And you just walked around the earth. What is it saying? It's saying just by evaluating the earth, you could see, you could see that there's a God. There's something got to be intelligent. Intelligent design means intelligent designer. The way that this is brought out in apologetics, which is the defense of the faith in regards to whether or not there is a God, is, is this illustration is often used. It's called the watch defense. And the watch defense is that if you were walking along the sidewalk and you found an Apple iWatch, and you picked up that thing, you already had the Apple iPhone, you're not that person that sends that green text in the group chat. When you send texts, it's blue. And so you found a watch that connects to your Apple reality and you can now, with a watch, connect your contacts, and you can, you can see some fitness updates, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is designed beautifully to integrate into everything that was designed beautifully, and how all this works together is amazing. Do you know what you wouldn't, you know what you wouldn't summarize? You wouldn't be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that over billions of years, all of these particles came together for this unbelievably intelligent design. You know why? Because that's irrational. That's why. And what this is saying is that when you look at the world, the most rational and reasonable response is that a creative world was created by a creative God. That a, that a world that has purpose. You want to look for purpose? You know what's really tough? You know what's really tough to create purpose out of? The fact that you were an accident. You weren't. You were completely on purpose. That the God of heaven, an almighty, all-powerful being, spent time shaping and molding and creating you. And that's what, in part, shapes the Christian faith. So to divorce yourself from that starts a whole nother conversation. And so, so much, and I want you to see this because this is going to play out. A society, not just an individual, so there's results, there's consequences when an individual does it, and then it's going to walk through the consequences when not only an individual divorced himself from the belief in God, but an entire culture. Watch this. Verse 21. For although they knew God... They neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. So there's an element of when you're not walking with God, there's, a, there's, there's darkness in you, but then that darkness grows as a result of your choices. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. So the intelligent of the intelligence as Paul will write to the church at Corinth, will be frustrated because they can't, they can't with just a textbook figure out the solution to a complex reality in human, in human living. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God. So the beauty and glory that comes with the God that made that sky last night, it has to be exchanged with something. Because you know why? Because eternity was set in your hearts from the beginning. Remember last, last series? And you were created by a God for eternity. And so as a result, you, you were designed for worship, not to be glorified yourself, but to glorify something. And so, so as a result, you were designed for that, but you've denied God. And so guess what you start to do? You start to shape your own gods. 
Because it's in your being. It's in, in who you were made to be. And so you've got to create something else to worship. And they exchanged the glory of immortal gods for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. So we're taking a God that we can't fully understand. And because we can't fully understand it, it means that he must not exist. And so let's create things that we can understand. And let's worship those things that we can understand. What a hopeless reality. That's what happens. For although, I'm sorry, for verse 22, uh, 4. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires and their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than creator, who is forever praised. Amen. I love that Paul in it just bakes in this idea that we're going to continue to praise God even in the middle of a society that's walking away from him. So here's what happens. Here's what, watch this, watch this. In, in the divorcing of your relationship with God, you lose your identity. And as a result of losing your identity, you maximize or you, you illuminate elements of your identity and it becomes the primary reality of who you are. This is exactly what's happening in the sexual revolution right now, in real time, live time. What's your primary identity? Who you're attracted to now. That's, that's now the, the chief cultural identity. Right? Even your pronouns are affiliated with who you identify as. And so we have an identity crisis across the nation, an identity crisis not only for the soul of a nation, but for the soul of everybody in the nation. And a lot of that is because we've determined that God doesn't exist. Watch, it continues. It doesn't stop there. Verse 26, because of this, uh, we, uh, no, we didn't read this. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relationships for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. By and large, what we are experiencing in the sexual revolution. Verse 28. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossipers and slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, and no mercy. And we call that tolerance. Although they know God's righteous decrees, that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Let me remind you, this is not written to America. Let me tell you, there are principles that are helpful to American Christians. There are parallels that are in this text that run right alongside where we are going. Do you see what the end result was? What's the end result? Complete and total relational chaos. Division at its highest level. You know why? Because when you believe that there is a God, what happens is there's a, there's a horizontal line that gets placed and it's God, creator, and it's creation. And then the biblical world view says that creation is flawed. Every single person falls short of the glory of God. In fact, they were made to glorify God. They weren't made for glory. And so as a result, we have very clear right and wrong. We have purpose. We have an identity. And in fact, we, we have our identity, our primary identity, isn't who we're attracted to, isn't what we do for a living, isn't any of those things. Our primary identity, above all other identities, is that we are a child of the Most High God. That's who we are. Like, we're going to inherit 
heaven and the presence of God in a perfect place. But that, that entire inheritance began with us not being worthy. Like we couldn't do it ourselves. And so the, the Christian worldview says that God's up here and we're down here. And the only way that we get to identify with God is when the cross, right? The cross makes a way because the cross pays for our sin. But then the resurrection of Jesus gives us the power to live the way that we were always intended to live from the beginning. That's the gospel message. And that's what we need to share so people not only see it, but hear it. But, but here's what's happening. Here's what Paul's is illustrating. Paul's saying, listen, when you get rid of God and, and everybody else, right, when right and wrong, and identity and purpose, what ends up happening in a society as it becomes more secular, as it works, works its way away from God, what happens is the moral boundaries become less horizontal and more vertical. Here's what I mean by that. What I mean by that is you make up your own way. What ends up becoming right and wrong is basically whether or not you agree with me. And so it's, it's, that's why I poked fun at the word tolerance. It's because that word's thrown around from both sides of many conversations, and yet the irony is that nobody's tolerant of anybody. We're as divided as we've ever been in my life. And so what it becomes is it becomes left and right. I mean, hypothetically speaking, I'm not saying this is real life right now, but right and left. That's left, that's right. Left and right. Black and white, not morally, but racially. It becomes about your tribe and my tribe. You know what that is? That's a gang mentality. That's what that is. And what it means is, is, is you are acting with integrity so long as you continue to do what our tribe says is right. And then when you disrupt our tribe, you're wrong. And so what's the new highest level of character? It's not integrity. It used to be that you do what's right even when no one's looking. Even when no one's looking, you do what's right. It's not, integrity isn't what you do when no one's looking. It's also what you do when everybody is looking. That's the whole of integrity. But that used to be, used to be what we taught. You remember when we used to, anybody still tell your kids that? You know what? That is not the cultural character of the day. You know what it is? Are you loyal? It's loyalty over integrity. Integrity, you do what it takes, how it takes, whatever it takes to make sure we win because we are the moral authority. You see how that works? And each tribe is fighting for their moral authority. Why? Because there is no God. And so we must win, because if we don't win, then bad people are going to end up winning. And as a result of bad people winning, then our whole society is going to crumble. You, you take out somebody right now, and you ask them about their political view of the world. You know what they're going to tell you? They're going to tell you, if this guy wins the next election, everything's wrong. And then you find somebody on the other side. They will tell you this. You take them out to lunch. Ask them about America. They tell you if this character or this, this candidate wins, we're all, we're all donezo, every one of us. So how can, why are both saying that so strongly? Because we are secularizing our society and we think it's not about God, it's about our tribe. That's why. That's the battle we're currently in. That's why we're so divided. Is because it's more tribal than it is anything else. Integrity, integrity only matters if you're screwing up on the other side. It doesn't really matter if somebody in my tribe is blowing it on the integrity side because we're still winning. And if that's what it takes, then we try to win. And so that's what he's explaining. So that's where we are. Congratulations. You, you're here. We're here. <laughs> what an encouraging Sunday here at Anthem. But there is hope. There's tremendous hope. In fact, there's an opportunity we may not have had for decades. And that opportunity is that people are lost. They're hungry for something authentic. They're desperate for an identity that's greater than one, any one aspect of who they are. I'm telling you right now, guys, the world out there is desperate for not the Jesus that we bring as our mascot, but for the real Jesus of the scriptures. 
And there's perhaps no greater opportunity than ever before in my lifetime than right now to give them the real Jesus, not the one that you shape, the one that is shaping you. So for a moment, I want to step aside from the societal, cultural reality that we're living in and now begin to say, what what do we do now? How do we approach this? How does Jesus, as the question is asked, how would Jesus interact with the world that we are living in? Number one, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Jesus isn't reactionary, and we shouldn't be either. You know what that means? That means that sometimes when you read that post online, you don't have to comment. I know it's crazy, but it's, it's, it's actually okay. You know what I've never heard? Somebody changed their opinion online. You know what I've never read in the comments? You are so right. Thanks for bringing up those 17 articles that you just sent me. I'm great. I'm now voting a different way. Thank you for your kind words today. You've been helpful, and I have decided to join your team. Never. Never. You know what I do see? Let me go back. They are gossipers, slanders. See a lot of that. And so we just got to come back to this place. Jesus isn't reactionary. When Jesus shows up on the scene, God hasn't spoken to his people for 400 years, and Jesus spends 30 years preparing for three years of ministry. And because he spent those 30 years, and because he's fully God and fully man, he's ready, right, to engage the world where they are, but also with a, with a deep understanding of where we are going. And that, that the battle isn't just a physical battle, it's a spiritual battle. And that there's systems, and I need to stand strongly against the systems that oppress people. But there's also people in the systems that I care about. John 3.16, you know what that conversation is about? It's about a guy in the system that's oppressing people, sneaks away to get with Jesus. You know how Jesus responds to him? With the most famous verse that you've ever memorized. And so the system is something that oftentimes does need to be challenged. But remember, there are people within the systems. So Jesus isn't reactionary. Jesus shows up on the scene, really, right? And, and, and in, in, the early, in the early days of his ministry, he, he's even doing miracles. You know what he says to people? Don't tell anybody. I was just discipling some guys this last week, and we walked through this in, in the early chapters of Mark. Jesus performs miracles. like, don't tell anybody. In, in uh, Bible college, we call this the messianic secret. It's so confusing to a new believer. It's like, I thought we were supposed to tell everybody. Now I'm reading about how Jesus did some cool stuff, and he's saying, don't share it? Because the Jesus of the scriptures is super strategic, and he's got a whole plan, and that plan isn't to overthrow Rome. It's to overthrow sin. You know why? Because you could overthrow Rome and a new empire would arise. And guess what you would have? The secularization of a society all over again. But if you overthrow sin, then every people and every society for every generation will have the opportunity to be what they were designed to be. That's why. And so when they're trying to strategize overthrowing Rome, do you know what he does? The miracle recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he And they were like, we want to make you king. You know what he does? Walks away. Do you know why? Because they want Jesus to be their mascot. And Jesus won't be shaped. He only shapes. And so this is this reminder to us that we can't be reactionary. We worship a God who wins. We worship a God who in the end has a plan. We worship a God who is sovereign over the kingdoms of the earth. And get this, according to Daniel, he gives power to whom he wishes. And I know that may, that may beg some more questions than you were even ready to answer. But we got to come back to this place that if we worship a sovereign God who's strategic and you're part of the plan, then you have to be prayerful. You have to live on purpose. You have to constantly, if Jesus had to pull away, guess what you have to do with your responsibilities? Oftentimes pull away. Rest. Respite. Spend time with him. 
Marinate in your relationship with him. Be prayerful. Meditate on the things of scripture. Right? Don't just seek to understand. Seek to become. That's the Jesus of the scriptures. So don't, we're not reactionary. Number two, number two. Jesus understands the battle isn't just against flesh and blood. Listen to what same author of Romans will write in the, uh, his letter to the church of Ephesus. He writes verse chapter six, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Notice he did not just say it's not just against. There's no just in there. He says the primary battle here is not at all physical. You know what that means? That means it's less about the courthouse down in Vista, and it's more about Satan getting thrown out of heaven. It's less about like that public school system and more about there's real demons and real angels, and they're, real fighting, they're really fighting in a realm we can't see. That's what that means. That means that if you're not engaging the spiritual reality, then you won't be effective in the war. It means that you're bringing a knife to a gunfight. And so for us, we've got to be engaged in the spiritual reality. Men, part of the reason that, that we want to equip you with a robust prayer life is because you're going to face some challenges in the world. But you know why? But we, all, we, we also want you to be fully prepared to have a positive impact on the spiritual reality of our world. And, and so we can, we can watch the news and feel like we're losing the war, or we can prayerfully consider how God might be faithful to his promises in our life. And watch how God uses that to have an impact with those around us. I went to wrestling school when I was 19. You're like, how does this relate? Just follow. And it, it, when you go to wrestling school, everybody wants a character, right? Hulk Hogan in the 80s. You guys remember Hulk Hogan in the 80s? Ultimate warrior, right? Came out running with the paint, yeah. And... The thing about it is the characters are, it's like a male soap opera. That's all WWE is. It's a hilarious male soap opera with really good athletes. And, and the ones that do the best, right, they not only have good in-ring skills, they also have good mic skills, right? Anybody know The Rock? You know where The Rock, the Rock started before he owned the XFL and was in every child movie since 1998? You know what he was doing before all that? If you smell, he was unbelievable on the microphone. What the rock is cooking, it was all about the, it was all about the characters. And you know what set the tone for the characters is the entrance. When you came in and your music hit, the crowd went, the crowd popped and it was loud, and it was, the kids were screaming, they got signs made, the smoke, fireworks, it was all that. So when I'm in wrestling school, I'm like, I can't wait to have my character. I came up with one. It was going to be the golden boy, Casey Owens. And I was going to be a flash ad hair then. The character wouldn't have lasted. And I was going to be real flashy and real fun and all, all that jazz. And, uh, so when I went to go find out about my first match, I'm like, oh, I got to buy my tights. I got white tights, gold trim down the side. Like, I don't have them yet. Coach, I don't have them yet. He's like, you won't need them. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm the golden boy, Casey Owens. Like, I'm going to show the world who I am. And I can't wait for the music to hit. He's like, oh, hold on. Your first three matches are going to be without a character. You're just going to have black tights. And you're going to wrestle a guy in front of no crowd. I'm like, that feels weird, coach. I could like do that with my brothers in the backyard. He's like, no, you're going to learn that you can do what we do safely. You're going to learn that what, what we do, right, matters more beyond the character. They were prepping me for the greater purpose. They were prepping me for the greater understanding. So here's why I share that with you. You may have been waiting for me to have this series, to answer the questions of the day, to begin to boldly stand on God's truth. And, and that's, that moment is this series, and yet at the same time, we're not cueing your music. And the reason we're not cueing your music with your character of Jesus is because the whole faith is designed for Jesus to shape us. 
And the Bible isn't about just what we're seeing in the physical realm. It means we need to engage the spiritual realm so that God can shape and mold us. So all I'm handing out today are black Speedos. That's it. To begin to prepare you for the battle that is out there. Fighting it Jesus' way, not yours, not mine. Because guys, I'm an emotional person. Any, any other emotional people in here? If we fight my way, there's going to be a lot of yelling, a lot of fist throwing, and probably a lot of damage, including, including my own, everywhere. So we can't fight my way, and I definitely don't think we can fight your way, because I bet you the results are very similar. Jesus understands the battle isn't just against flesh and blood. And finally, Jesus loves people who are caught up in sin. We're having a conversation about the secularization of a society, and there are millions of people that Jesus loves represented in this culture war. And if we forget that, we forget his heart, we forget the whole purpose for the fight. And you may be thinking, yeah, but, but, but I'm ready to fight, like really fight. Like if the Civil War happened, I'd be ready. I'm just telling you, that's not, that's not the battle that Jesus is interested in. You want me to prove it to you? We don't have a ton of time, but let me, let me just show you. The greatest sermon I ever preached, Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Listen to this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the strong people that beat everybody up. Mm. I wish I said that, but it doesn't. That's why I'm not shaping you, and Jesus is shaping me. Because the truth says what? Blessed are the meek. Because the meek inherit the earth. You want to fight Jesus' way? It's going to look a little different. Okay, so you're like, well, that's just one chapter. But it keeps going, by the way. If you want to keep reading Matthew 5, we could, and it would say the same thing over and over and over again, different ways, but saying ultimately the same thing. But then Paul will write to the church at Philippi. You know what he says to them? In your attitudes, be like Jesus. You know what he meant by that? Why? Jesus took on the very nature of a servant became nothing, being made in human likeness. He did not consider his relationship with God something to be grasped. Instead, he became a servant, and he loved, and even became obedient to death, death on a cross. That's the Jesus way. My friends, I invite you to the Jesus way. Back there, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a, um, a sword. It's Jesus' sword. I want to show it to you. It's just so cool. It's like an ancient, ancient towel. It's pretty dull. And if you show up to a war with a towel, it feels like you're going to lose. But in John chapter 13, in his locker room speech with the disciples, this is how he showed them how to fight. This moment when he would hand what we now call the church, when he promised the spirit, what he set in motion in John chapter 13 in the upper room, 12 guys who shaped the world. No titles, just Jesus. And they would shape the world perhaps more than any other leader with any other title that would come before them. And Jesus with those guys grabbed a towel, and he got down on a knee. And you know what this position is? It's vulnerable. It's dirty. It's reserved for the lowest of the lows. And the God of heaven put skin on, grabbed a towel, and took a knee. And said, this is how we fight. This is how we love. This is how the world will know you are my disciples, by how you love one another. 
So if you grab your sword and bring your mascot Jesus to the fight, I'm telling you, God's not going to bless that. But you grab a towel and you grab a knee and you serve those who God brings into your life. And I can't guarantee you that none of them will reject you. And I can't guarantee you none of them will take advantage of you. You know why? Because in that room was one man that did exactly that to Jesus. Do you know what he did? He didn't ask him to step out of line. And when it was his turn, put your feet up. This is how we fight. We love. And God will bless that. God will be faithful to that. You and I just need to trust him. Let's pray. God, it's not lost on me that there are people in this room that, um, that are walking through some very real challenges that the reality of the culture wars has, has made its way into their home and is impacting people that they really love. And in those really complex, nuanced situations, uh, God, we need your help. We need your wisdom. God, the posture of serving and loving is so helpful and absolutely foundational uh, to us as believers. And yet, God, oftentimes we don't know what that looks like in the real complexity of our, our worlds. So, God, you, you say to, to ask for wisdom if we need it, and we in this room are asking for wisdom. We want to love and we want to serve, but, God, we need your help to know what it looks like, to know how to love well, to know how to stand up when we need to stand up, to know how to fight systems that are, that are oppressing people, that are hurtful to society. Um, but God, how to love people within the system at the same time. God, to know, to know what this looks like in our world it could only, can only be done if we follow your spirit that is guiding us. So God, we, we ask that you would guide and lead. We ask that you would forgive. In this moment, there's not probably a person in this room that has fought the battle incorrectly, including me. So God, we come humbly we come before you asking for your forgiveness. May that forgiveness inform the battle for us. As forgiven people, filled with grace, filled with mercy, passionate about truth, we need you. Only you can make sense of this thing for us, for our world. Only you can pave a road forward we invite you into this space. Meet your children where they are today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.